name's Tom Streit. I'm an artist here in town. Um, for a couple of you guys know, very awesome. uh, and today we are doing a, we're a conversation about art of the place. Um, so uh, we've got three presenters here. Our third is actually on his way up right now. So we all know how uh, far his mission is going. It's kind of those uh, funny things. But, so, um, to start us off today, Okay. All right. All right. All right. Now we have everybody. We've got everybody here. Um, so, kind of getting us in the mood this morning. So, we're talking about art of the place. Um, so, you know, place and place making, making art. Um, we just started. We're going to start with a video about the Midway murals. This is not in Indiana. This is in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. And so, this was a project uh, that I think is one of those places. But really inspiring video. So I wanted to find a way to, to bring people together to make them feel better about <coughs> and I wanted to help businesses because when small businesses are doing well, you know, folks in the neighborhood feel better, houses are more attractive and people are out and about more. Um, and so public art seemed to be a, a wonderful way to do that. And then I was just fortunate enough to uh, to get part of the Night Arts Challenge uh, to lead th this project in its entirety, which is which was four murals, uh, four professional muralists, all with very different approaches, different perspectives, using different art mediums, collaborating with immigrant business owners along Snelling Avenue as well as the residents in the neighborhood to create murals along the theme of starting anew. And one of the great things about the project is that it's really brought the cultural diversity of the neighborhood out into the forefront and, and much more visible. Uh, it really prettied up some of the buildings and a stretch of snelling that had some vacancy and was looking kind of a little bit higher. And at the same time, the city of Midnight have been uh, making improvements to this stretch of snelling with improvements to the sidewalk and making it more pedestrian friendly and street lanterns. And so the combination, I think, is really going to have a big impact on this stretch of Snelling Avenue. And Snelling Avenue is, is such a central location for not only our neighborhood, but for the entire city of St. Paul and, and really for the Twin Cities in general. And a big part of this project has been introducing some of those businesses and business people to folks in the neighborhood who may not have known that much about them before. Part of the event on Saturday actually brought a lot of people into those businesses, maybe for the first time in some cases. Saw what they had to offer. There was food, uh, a lot of conversation, and that was all really great. It's very important that, that whoever the artists were, that they be really committed to community engagement. And that's not for all artists. So they had to they had to be willing to have conversations, willing to connect with the folks who live here, um, and, and make that a, an integral part of the project. I mean, you just sit out here for for an hour watching these folks work, and the engagement with the people who are walking by is just is just tremendous. But I think in the end, um, there's something for everyone here, and people have found that that art in as many different forms uh, really just brings a lot of joy to the neighborhood. And my hope is that it can really be a launching point for for more conversations, more collaboration, you know, stronger you know, economic development, and, uh, and more folks really caring about and feeling pride in and, and connections to, to the neighbors here in, in the neighboring neighborhood. Again, that was in St. Paul, Minnesota. But we have a lot of awesome projects that are happening right here in So the first speaker we have today is Julie Newmore. So she's the director of public art at the Arts Council of Minneapolis. She has an academic background in contemporary art, has taught art appreciation and art history at local colleges and universities, and for 14 years serves as the gallery director for the art, Indianapolis Art Center. As part of the role of the Arts Council, <coughs> she helps neighborhoods and city leaders think about how to use public art as a tool to create a place in the community and development. So, I'd like to welcome Julia here today. Her. Um, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I know some of you here. Uh, I know Probably some of me, if I knew your names, I would know your names, but not your faces, and so that's really pretty cool and out in the neighborhood, uh, out and about a lot. Um, so I'm going to start before I kind of launch into everything uh, that I have to say. I want to ask you a question, which is, how many of you have art in your neighborhoods already? Raise your hand. Oh, great! Yeah, so a little over half of you. That's awesome. 
How many of you want more art in your neighborhood? <laughs> Lots of hands that didn't go up before. Awesome. That's great. So what I'm going to talk to you about is um, the, uh, one specific program um, that the Arts Council runs, um, which is the Traffic Signal Control Loss Art Program. But I'll also tell you a little bit about how the Arts Council can serve as a resource to you for getting arts into your neighborhood. Um, so you may know the Arts Council, we've done a lot of murals, we do a lot of murals on underpasses around town, those in-dot underpasses, how many of you have seen one before? Great, how many of you live near one? A few of you, how many of you would like to live near one? Okay, talk to me about that later. Um, so we also do murals that aren't just painted murals on something static. We are responsible for the High Art Program, this is a partnership with Clear Channel where we put um, art on billboards all around town. Uh, they rotate, you choose 10, they rotate for a year, um, and they end up going in neighborhoods a lot of times. You know, even when they're kind of up high, they're pretty cool. See these around town? Um, um, we also have some um, other unusual kinds of murals. They don't have to be painted. This is a project that we did on Delaware Street, just north of City Way. Um, the, you can see in the upper left hand corner, that's what it looked like before. It was a mural that had been put up in the middle of the 70s. Um, it had been, nobody really owned it, it had been allowed to deteriorate, and then as part of creating this um, great gateway and enhancement to City Way neighborhood, um, we were commissioned to um, install the mural that you see below, which are strips of uh, painted steel interspersed with mirrors. And so as you ride down, or bike down, or walk down, or even drive by, you can see yourself reflected in this, and that this sort of idea of color and speed uh, is very important. Um, we also do traditional murals like this. This is a railway retaining wall, and in the lower right hand corner, you can see what it used to look like. This is down on South Madison. Um, and uh, before we got to it, it was a magnet for tagging and sort of ugliness, and they didn't even really bother to keep the lawn up, because why? Um, so this is owned by CSX Railway, and we got permission um, for them to do this mural, and this is the after. How many of you have seen this one? One of a couple of you? It's really great. Just go um, pen south, when it turns into Madison, just past Lily, it's on the right. Question? No, the comment. Yeah. It's the wrong angle, but I love how the tree trunks actually go up into the yes. trees. Yes, that's the you very cool. I mean, you see it so a little cool. bit better if you're, if you're head on, but uh, yeah, it's very cool. The artist, and again, this was a place-based mural, and the artist uh, deliberately said, what's needed here? You know, and, and created the mural based on the site, not just something he wanted to do out of his head. So you can see that simply by adding artwork, the entire feeling of a place can change and it can dismal to dynamic and from neglected to inspiring. And so this is really what, I, what we're all kind of talking about today. So every neighborhood has something like this. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have something like this in your neighborhood and maybe don't want it. So this is a traffic signal box. It's been tagged, it's been painted over with mismatched paint and it's been tagged again. Uh, it's, it's ugly, it's an eyesore. This one is unfortunately about a block from our office. Uh, this one is at 10th and 10th. Um, but what if I told you that these pieces of light could actually be neighborhood attractions and could actually create your neighborhood rather than the pressure of your neighborhood <coughs> that is something other than neglect and ugliness. Um, this is what happened a couple of years ago. It started in the Irvington neighborhood. Um, a couple of neighbors just like you, they were not an organization, they were not even artists, they were just neighbors. Um, they decided to take control, so they raised some money, they invited local artists, and they worked with the city to get permission to make these traffic signal boxes into small pieces of art. How many of you have seen this one particularly? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, other neighborhoods have since gotten into the act. This is uh, Irvington, another Irvington piece on the left, obviously, and on the right um, is Fletcher Place. Um, artist of this, raise your hand. But yes, and it. Um, and it on the right. um, so in fact, um, the city received so many requests last year that they asked the Arts Council to handle the program for them. So we, I worked out the details, I worked with um, DPW, and worked with Department of Code Enforcement, and you know everything to make it really easier for people, and to really make the Arts Council the one-stop shop for getting projects like this done. So now anyone can come to us and we can learn how to use these boxes to claim your neighborhood's character. 
Um, so this spring, the West Indy neighborhood um, worked with uh, Keeping Up This Beautiful's um, Brain Indy Cleanup Program, and then also with the Arts Council for a traffic single box, single box program at the same time. Um, really made a difference in the neighborhood in a short period of time. How many people here are from West Indy? Nobody in this room? Oh, I don't know. What? Oh, someone was? No. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 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 um, and artists uh, sent in their designs. They also brought a neighborhood committee together with <coughs> Arts Council experts, um, and they got about 14 or 15 designs submitted, and they selected eight. I'm going to show this to you right now. Um, so this one they selected because it showed off the family-friendly aspects of the neighborhood, and this is beautiful. Uh, Gabriel Lehman is a local illustrator, um, and uh, I just love this. It's like a summer sunset with a sack race, and so this is something that we all kind of can instantly look at, feel good about, and um, it's extremely uh, well done. A um, couple of other boxes. Um, the idea of having a bright graphic design, it makes street corners happier and feel more friendly. Um, the one on the left is at the Mary Ruth Neighborhood Center. The one on the right is actually right by the river um, at Kentucky and White River Parkway. And I love the way she chose to do a, even though it's a sea creature that is, does not live in that waterway, it kind of gives that sort of waterway feeling um, for the neighborhood. It kind of reminds you that the water is there. Um, this is probably my favorite. It's placed right next to a lily facility in a place that looks really industrial, but it's on a street corner where people waved across the street to a lily building. Um, it's very funny. It sort of imagines the traffic signal box as an alien, and on the top, which normally you can't see it, but it's not really a message for you. It's a message to the overlords. <laughs> we have landed undetected, uh, which I thought was a very, very funny. Um, some of the best artists in the city participated, including Andrew, who we'll talk next about another project he's working in. And uh, Andrew's design honored the industrial plant that it was placed next to, and that site uh, was once the plant that produced <coughs> the very first winner of the E500, the Mormon, the Mormon Watts. And so that is Andrew's take on the box. Right, Andrew? <laughs> and uh, this is kind of kitty corner from it at the other side of that plant site. And this is another artist, Brendan Fields, who used the exact same subject, but used his own particular style to talk to um, indicate the Marmon Wasp. And so to the subject matter is the same, but the artistic approach is totally different. And so this is another thing that you can do, is you can talk about things in different ways and have it look different, simply because of the different styles of the artists. Um, these are, um, these <coughs> small canvases are um, extremely challenging in a good way for the artists, um, and they're really fun. I've had so many artists tell me, oh, I want to do another one, this one is just so much fun. Um, the neighborhood can even participate. Uh, this box is located right, neck at, right at the Key Learning Community, which is a school on the west side. It was designed by the students there. Um, it was painted by the art teacher. Um, so you can see the street side of the box is on the left, and the sidewalk side of the box is on the right, and then that design wraps on, on the, two, the other two sides, the approach from either direction. Um, so it's very cool. Um, the West Indian neighborhood really loves their boxes, um, and they love the improvement that Zippy's made. Um, they're, in a few short months, they've just become local landmarks, and to my knowledge, I don't think anyone's tagged any of them. Do <coughs> uh, you want to talk, um, Danny, for a moment about what you've noticed about any changes in the neighborhood or any reactions to boxes? Um, I can speak to you from a personal perspective. I, sure. Um, I, I know I, I drive up Washington Street a lot, and um, you know, I remember before some of the art was placed on these boxes, I would um, see them and I, I felt like, man, I see a lot of tagging, and I said, you know, something should be done with this, and, um, and lo and behold, a few weeks later, I see a person um, you know, doing some art with one of the boxes, and I thought it was amazing, you know, to be able to um, sit at a stop, you know, a stoplight, and just look over to the side and see something that um, makes me feel good. Um, I can look at and, and not see the light, but I can see something more, you know, you know it impacts me because I, I get to I get to enjoy it. You know, really. Thank you. 
So this one is not here. Um, this is in Australia. But I'm going to show you some, some boxes that are not here to just sort of talk about what makes a successful box. So the key to having a successful box is to really have a professional artist involved and also to help them uh, is help them get to know your neighborhood because they more than, the more they know you, the more the design is going to reflect um, what you want it to reflect. So you can take the artist on a neighborhood walk um, or invite them to a neighborhood association meeting or um, a community party just and give them plenty of background information so they know what they're doing. So this box, uh, which is in Australia, um, really brings a lot of color and energy to what's normally a pretty bland kind of streetscape, but by um, incorporating what people feel about their neighborhood, not exactly what they see, it's, it's bringing in a lot of the life that people see in the neighborhood, even though people just driving by that don't know it wouldn't notice it. And I just love the way that it's kind of, the box kind of disappears, and that if you look at it from the right angle, it just gives a little window into sort of the vibrancy and the joy that people have in the neighborhood, even though it's not at all liberal. Um, you can invite a single, one artist to do all the boxes in your neighborhood. Um, this is um, a whole city <coughs> project in um, Emeryville, California, and he probably did about 12 boxes, um, and they're all this black on uh, yellow, kind of taking off the idea of street signs, but making them a little bit conceptual, a little bit uh, unusual, and definitely neighborhood landmarks. If you plan it right, um, a set of boxes can be completed within six months. So it's a quick project also. Um, the Arts Council is there every step of the way. We can help you. We make sure it's your project. It's not our project, but we help connect you to the artist. We help develop a process. Um, we have a few technical requirements that help the art on the box last longer. And we mostly work that out with the artist, but we let you guys know what they are as well. Um, and it also um, makes the boxes easier to maintain because um, you will be signing an MOU with the city that commits to maintaining these boxes and then these boxes are up for three to five years. And then after three, three to five years, you are required to either change the art or paint it over. So, and that keeps things fresh and lively so people don't get used to it. And in fact, if there are boxes that are tagged, it's because they've been there for too long and they kind of blend into the background. Um, you do have to fund the project yourself, but we help you with ideas um, on where to find the money, and I hope if everything goes well, we are going to be having a program where we can help you with that funding as well. Yes? What is the average funding? Um, the average cost of a box, um, depending on whether you do it in paint or whether you do it as a vinyl wrap, it can be with, um, as low as 500 a box and as high as about 1500 or 2000 a box. So you get to pick how you do. We ask that you pay the artists but you get to pick how much you pay them. Um, the vinyl wrap is pretty expensive. It costs anywhere from 750 to $1,000 for a vinyl wrap. So painting is a little bit less expensive. Does the 500 include the RSV? The 500 does include the RSV. Yes. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, um, I'll take five minutes of questions. Um, I do have a handout that you can get at the end of the session. It's just a brief handout of the, the program itself. You can go to the link that's on the handout and then you can download a full pack information packet about the program and then my card is there if you need me. So let's take questions. Is there a limit to how many you do each nope. year? Um, however many you can afford. Okay. Does the vinyl wrap last longer or shorter than the um, that's a, an interesting question. Um, it probably lasts about the same. You need to be very, um, uh, you need to get a lot of information from the vinyl wrap vendor and find out what product they're using. Um, and it depends a lot on where the box is. If it's on an open corner where it's getting the full brunt of the wind and the rain and the sun, then it's not going to last as long as if it's in a little protected corner. And so we can help you with that. Um, if you, I can, if you have a number of boxes that you want to do, you can look, go on the site with you and help you figure out, okay, this one, you're going to get a good five years out of the wrap on this one, on this corner, but on this corner, about all you can yeah, with the um, wraps, the two things that could happen are fading and then uh, the, the loss of adhesion or the, or the cracking because of the final one stick. But there are ways around that, and we can talk to you about that separately. Any other questions quickly about this program? And I'll be happy to answer more later. We'll have, <coughs> at the end, after all three of us have talked, um, we'll have some general questions. And so if you have more questions that you think of, 
Next up, we've got Andrew, uh, Andrew Summers. Yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Um, so Andrew is an artist working here in Indianapolis. Um, he's been working professionally as a muralist and a graphic designer for his company Murals.tv. Uh, he co-founded the gallery. In, uh, make sure I'm saying the joke. Boyer, Boyer Art. Boyer Art the Fletcher. Boyer Art the Fletcher. The Fox Square neighborhood around 2011. Uh, since the start of that gallery. Uh, he has been working on uh, renovating a new kind of art space around downtown, or right outside of downtown that might include a rooftop, rooftop garden and then a place for a neighborhood farmers market and arts market. So, but today you're going to talk about it. So, yeah. <coughs> okay, um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm a muralist. I have done quite a few murals that involve community input. Um, okay. I've done quite a few murals that involve community input and trying to get as much of the community involved as possible. I've been uh, lots of volunteers helping the murals in the process to try to make it uh, feasible and smooth to do large projects on the lesser budget, so I've catered my artistic style towards that over the past few years, and I'm going to talk about some of my experiences with that, in case, from an artistic artist standpoint, in case anybody is uh, wanting to start, initiate some large art projects. So, this is, um, here's a bridge we did, uh, this is 9th and Sherman. And the uh, first thing you have to worry about is um, permission, and permission that not just from the police, but you need to have permission from the property owner, and um, you also want to get the neighborhood support <coughs> in the uh, installation of things. The, uh, you want to get as much neighborhood involvement as possible because things can get political. Neighbors can complain and they can uh, start to speak to the neighbors, neighborhoods that you want to um, definitely reach out as much as possible to uh, the active members of the neighborhood. And uh, property owner, if it's a, uh, if you're doing a, if you know the property owner, then uh, no problem if you're doing something like a city property or CSX property, it can get a little bit more complicated and it's really it would be much better to talk to you about that. So, uh, and then also you want to notify the police, let them know what you're doing so that they don't think it was coming out of your <coughs> um, Planning, you want to uh, definitely want to form a good relationship with an organizer and an artist. So that's a very important aspect is the organizer and artist relationship and having them be able to work together. Uh, <coughs> so, like, the uh, biggest thing you want to do if possible, you want to make sure that you can pull it off. Because <coughs> it's easy just to let the ideas flow and be like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do this, but when it comes down to it, if you commit to a large project, you have to see it through. So make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into. <coughs> and that's where having hiring a professional artist helps with that. So next thing is budget. Is ideally you would have some kind of grant and lots of money that you can budget towards a large project like this. But um, 
I've, on many occasions I've done stuff like guerrilla style where we're fundraising ourselves and there's many different outlets <coughs> for that. There's um, Rocket Hub and um, Kickstarter, stuff like that. And do online fundraising, Facebook, social media promotion. And that's where the, the organizer aspect comes in really important. It's not it's not just a um, it's not just an artist doing something but for a large community project is there has to be an organizer present who can um, handle a lot of these situations so that the artist can focus on the art. Um, <coughs> want to uh, get as much neighborhood involvement as possible. If you do decide to do neighborhood involvement, just um, as far as volunteers, just be aware that there's, that invites a large scale of unpredictability. So you want to <coughs> make sure that you have plans to make up for lack of volunteers or you have know, too many volunteers and also safety is a huge issue you want to make sure that your volunteers are safe so that just goes back again to the organization is such an important factor um, <coughs> painting uh, this is the fun part everybody loves to do this uh, Fun. It's therapeutic. It's a good way of bonding with your neighbors. Um, but like I said, if you do decide to initiate a large volunteer project like this, just be very aware that sometimes you'll have no volunteers show up and you'll have to uh, make up for the work. And that's something I've gone through on a number of occasions. So Forewarned everybody. It's like you know what you're getting yourself into. A lot of people kind of jump into something like this, thinking they can do anything, but it, it takes a lot to really see it through. A lot of organization. <coughs> um, so last, um, <coughs> celebrate. Invite your. Uh, invite all the community out to uh, you know, bed and uh, just give like art is just such a great way to bring people together and um, it's a great opportunity to have something that the neighborhood can be proud of and to get as much people involved as possible. Um, that's about it. Is there any questions? Yeah. Yes, on the um, design, do you, does the artist typically have the design and it does the outline and kind of does a paint by number, so to speak, with numbers matching the volunteers to paint on the wall? Is yeah, that kind of the process? Yeah, the, okay. the artist comes out first and does the outline with the numbers. And that looks pretty well with the Yeah, that's, it the depends on, on like what. <coughs> This, the artwork has to be designed to, like for that method. So it's, it just depends. Like I've developed a really geometric style that is very good for that type of installation method. So like other artists, like you can do it like coloring book style. Like you just have to keep it simple. Um, no shading. Pretty much all block. Blocky, blocks of color, basically. That works fast. Um, what about the approval of the original design? How does that approval? Of the, your original design, is that sort of a group approval process of the well, organization itself? Basically, what we did for this project was we came up with a sketch and <coughs> started a rock up. So we did fundraising through the Rock Hub online, had this sketch on there, and the, there was 
there's no approval process. We just did it. But we want to as much community input as possible as well as we know that it's on the so your community input was largely generated online. And how do you arrange a discussion of community input? Well, there's you, no real discussion. There's, you have to um, basically do everything that you can. Like this particular project, the I had, um, it was initiated by the neighborhood um, neighborhood association. So they had actually gotten in contact with me and like they they have their own outlets for starting discussions like that. So you do that largely online through social media. And like I said, that's that's something like the organizer you want the organizer to take care of. Yeah. Um yeah, back to the design. So the artist chooses the, the design or is it something that the neighborhood a panel or the community can choose? And um, I, I think going back to her question, so once that's done or when those, those uh, uh, ideas come up, who makes the decision? Who makes the decision on it? On well, the, 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 uh, in this situation, it was the neighborhood association. They basically do this for them. Did they choose the design or did yeah. you choose the design? Yeah, I, they, I took in their input okay. and I created the design based on that. So you want to have taken as much input from as much, many people as you possible and then <coughs> talk to the artist about that. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I think it probably should be pointed out that all of these projects are different. They And I know Julia from the yeah, Arts Council can speak to that because we had yeah, Keegan and was beautiful, was working with them for all those murals underneath the underpasses. So, so some, I think yours in particular was just a one neighborhood little involvement. Mm -hmm. That's what we're project. talking about here on Sherman, yeah. Yeah, and then others are more, oh yeah, more, more citywide. Um, it, yes, they can be a little bit more, um, I mean, it, it depends on who's generating the idea and who's funding the idea. But if the neighborhood is funding the idea, then uh, the artists in the neighborhood are going to have a lot more interaction than if somebody else is funding the idea and providing the artist. And the, the artists aren't and the community isn't involved in the painting or anything, but they are involved in just sort of like a, you know, here's what the artist is proposing. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the level of involvement can vary depending on the needs and the desires of the neighborhood. Do you know neighborhoods that contact several artists and then choose the design of their mm -hmm. Yes, they can, they can definitely contact several and do a competition. Absolutely. Yeah, time for about one more question. We're going to have a question and answer session also at the end, suffer every speaker. So you, you want to go ahead and write down questions with the table and that's what we'll Sounds good. All right, thank, thank you, Andrew. You. All right, so for our third speaker, we have Danny Marquez from over on the west side of the United. So Danny um, is in the Near West, is the Near West City Life Director for, uh, for Central Indiana Youth for Christ. He's also the founder and director of the Engine Initiative. As a result of poor decision made in his past, Danny did over 10 years of his life in prison. While incarcerated as a youth, Danny's heart was revolutionized by the power of God's love it is now on a mission to help rebuild the same kinds of communities he once helped destroy. So everybody, uh, welcome in. Yeah, so I just press the button. Yep, yeah, just press that button. All right, so ENGINE. ENGINE is an acronym for engaging next generation to neighborhoods everywhere. And uh, we're on a mission to break the cycle of crime with inner city youth through interactive, um, community-oriented, faith-based programming. Um, so, uh, I'm here to talk about the Purpose Park. Has anybody ever heard of the Purpose Park, or um, you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yes, that's exactly it, the one with the car. So, you see, I, I love the way she answered here, because um, the car is really, uh, rep what she said is actually representative of what a lot of people um, see as a landmark. It's like, uh, you know, uh, a landmark, where 
you know, when we join events, um, I say something like, hey, you know where that yellow car is at? Oh, yeah, I know where that's at. You know, so it's really helpful, and it's actually doing its job, and I'll get into that in just a second. Right? No, you should, you should just be included. You know? yeah. All right, so the purpose part, this is, um, I'll get a little bit into my story here. I was at one time in, at my house, and my office, and I'm looking at the window, and, um, what you see now is actually a cleanup after what it originally looked like. Um, it was a mess, there were, you know, mud puddles everywhere. I see some of the children in the community literally swimming in these mud puddles. Um, you know, um, it was dumping brown for all kinds of furniture and you can imagine what other things. And, um, you know, so I, I felt like there was something that needed to be done with this bike in the community. And so um, I just started power mapping and looking around and finding people that might be interested in um, helping to see um, this space each you know trans transformed. And so one of the things I did was I, I reached out to Keep in the Adopt It's Beautiful and um, there was a long process, um, uh, application process, you know, I spent about I don't know how, how many hours, about two hours trying to fill that entire application out. And then I submitted it, but I submitted it with um, not knowing who the owner for the space was. I had no clue who else was going to get involved to make this project possible. And so um, I just stepped out of faith. And so when I you know, submitted the application, I got word from Teddy Stevens that um, we uh, were one of the people that got approved for um, the IPO in space grant. And Julie, for what it's in terms yeah, of Yeah, IPL. Yeah. yeah. Um, Keep it in Amherst Beautiful Ones um, gets funding from IPL to run the Green Space Project. They choose um, a handful. Uh, they have an open call for proposals. Um, neighborhoods submit uh, documentation of what they want to do, what they see in their neighborhood. They have pictures, and uh, they basically make the case for why they should get the attention for their project. Um, they narrow it down, and eventually they choose. I think we've uh, we just went through the process for 2016, and I think we have eight new hooks uh, in the project. Um, and the KIB doesn't give a direct financial grant to the neighborhood, but they use the funds to help the neighborhood put whatever their dream for the space is into place. And it could be cleaning up invasive um, uh, vegetation, it could be putting in a public park, it could be putting in a community garden, um, it could be making a safe crossing. Um, it could be honoring something that's in the neighborhood, like one of the ones this year has um, a historic oak. It's probably the oldest oak in the city uh, that's still standing. And so they have one of their uh, things that they want to do is to create a, um, a place where this oak can be seen and promoted and honored for the history that it's had with the neighborhood. So um, these projects are all extremely varied, and then once you get selected to put it in, then it's a three-year process with KIB. The first year is actually getting the, the process done. They assign a, a designer, a professional architect or landscape designer to um, help that work. And then uh, they work with the community. They um, organize community cleanup days, planting days, whatever it takes. Um, and then after it's implemented, then they work with you for two years after that to keep it up. And then they turn it over to the neighborhood to keep up after that. And so it's an education process. You learn all about plants. You learn all about um, creative placemaking and you know, all kinds of things. And one of the things that is an option is that um, you could get public art in that space. And the Arts Council participates in that. Um, and you kick in $10,000. Keep in the event is beautiful. It's in $10,000. Um, we help the neighborhood be the commissioner of the public art, we discuss with the neighborhood exactly what kind of art and what's the best process to find an artist and work with an artist, um, and then by the end of the project, the first year. Yeah, so we were thinking, you know, so we received the $10,000 grant to build on this space. And um, so we, uh, you know, when I say we, I just reached out to the people in the community. In fact, Terry Stevens um, invited me to uh, a meeting, quote unquote meeting that was happening and that I wasn't invited, but I needed to go. Um, so I say, are you sure about this? And so she says, yes, you just need to be there. And so she gave me the address and I went to the, to the house. It was at the Catholic worker. And there they are, everybody's just hanging around, drinking, you know, and, and just having a good old time, campfire out, out back. And um, I'm trying to figure out like, what I'm doing here. Um, I, I thought this was like a meeting for, um, you know, the park. And so it turned out that it wasn't needed for the park. And little did I know that an entire community had their eyes on this space and wanted to see this space transformed into something, you know, a beautiful, vibrant um, space in the community. 
So um, we started to brainstorm and um, we started to think about our vision, what the space should look like for the community. We wanted to bring in elements that um, you know, just uh, spoke to the, the rich history and the culture of the community. Um, so uh, long story short, we ended up hiring, when I say we, I should say, keeping me a nap is beautiful, hired um, Will Marquez. And Will Marquez is a, is a designer, and um, so he, one day I'm sitting uh, at one of the meetings, and he had some sketches, and on one of the sketches I seen a car, like in the ground, and I look at it, and people are not asking questions, a car in the ground? And they're like kind of skeptical, but me, I'm like, bingo, that's exactly what we need, and so, the reason why I personally felt that way is because I, I felt like something weird like that is going to attract a lot of attention, um, you know, and, and I tell you what, the car is definitely attracting a lot of attention. Um, it's, let me see, if I, this is what it looked like after the design. Um, so the car, as you can see, is, is facing right side up, right side of the ground, um, and basically we have about five people at least a day stopping by, taking pictures and asking questions about What's going on you know, at, this, at the purpose part? So it gives us the opportunity, engine um, and the team, to, to share some of the things that are happening at the space. Um, you know, we, and I'm gonna get into that in a few minutes here. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we uh, you can look over here and see these chairs. These are actually spools um, that we, we and here, um, they're the backs of the cribs, like the headboard and the footboard of the crib. And what we did was we transformed the spool into a chair that the community can sit on. We actually found those that crib board and you know, the headboard and the backboard in the alley. We took it, we cleaned it up, um, we painted over it, and we created an actual comfortable chair. We purchased a, a cushion that people could sit on and feel comfortable and, and so forth. So we're really into the idea of repurposing things, you know, you know, bringing life to what seems to have no purpose. Um, you know, so the car itself is it a 64 bottom build. It's a real car. We gutted the engine, we took out you know, the chairs, we took out the windows and replaced them with metal sheets. And on the bottom of the car, and, and by the way, um, they have um, I-beams that are welded into the car and going into the ground, so it's definitely safe. And we still have a sign that says, keep off the car, just the right? And so, um, <laughs> so, what we we metal, uh, welded a metal plate on the bottom of the car, and we're actually using that as a as a way to project movies onto the screen itself. So we have, you know, we'll get into that in just a moment. So the first event, as a result of this, a lot of people were excited. They they learned about the park. We did a lot of community canvassing, asking questions about you know what they would like to see. And interestingly enough, uh, when we you know just made the invitation for people to you know join us at the meetings. They, nobody showed up, and so, you know, it was just a group of us that decided to move forward with the project, and so we did, and this is the result of it. And a lot of people, once they seen the, the progress, they seen what was going on, they started to ask questions. How can I get involved? We want to know, um, is there anything we can do to help and so forth, and yet we put them to work. So that was a great thing, they started asking questions. So um, this was the result of, uh, um, the next slide you see here is um, the result of a community egg hunt that we started. That was the very first event that we had on the space. So it was Easter and we decided that we wanted to do something for the community. So we bought about a thousand eggs and we flooded the entire park with all these eggs. And you know, we created a flyer, went out to the community, started giving people on um, the flyer saying, hey, we're going to be doing this today. Come on by, bring your kids. We're going to have food. We're going to have hot dogs. We're going to have, you know, uh, hamburgers and other and they all showed up. And, and my, my mother-in-law was kind of surprised because she's like, man, it's too short notice. I don't know if anybody show up. But people are interested in seeing new things, number one, and they're also interested in either. Um, that's what people are doing. And every event that I've, um, you know, uh, we facilitated on the, uh, on, on the space that we always have food because it, food is like a really important element. Corey Ellis from New York, he once said he was a counselor out in New York, and he says, that one time he wanted to disrupt, you know, some of the crime that was happening in the neighborhoods, and that one time he came out of his car and he approached one of the guys, the gangsters, uh, on the corner. He said, "I need you off this corner. What can I do to help you to get off this corner?" You know what they said? They said, "Give me something to eat and something to do." 
So um, with those words, they, they absolutely inspired me, and that's the reason why we created programs like this, giving the people in the community something to do and something to eat. So um, the next thing that we did, the next event that we did was called Manamania. And Manamania is basically a, a ministry that's designed to reach out to children ages five. How, how am I looking on time? Two minutes left, so I gotta speak through this. Um, so, um, it's designed to reach children ages five to twelve, five to twelve more or less, and we we engage them through games, prizes, music, um, and Bible lessons, and um, and food. And so, you know, they have a blast. Let me move forward. Um, the next event we had was the movie night at the park. As you can see on the screen, we have an actual screen on the bottom of the car. We purchased two magnets. Um, the, kind of magnets that businesses put on their cars and we just put it on this car and we to engage the community to get them involved, keep them active and as a result of this, the community's crime has lowered significantly. I remember when I used to be out there, um, when, before this thing started, it was getting kind of like, you know, it was getting, I mean, I, I don't know the best term to use other than that, it was getting uh, really scary and so, as a result of these kinds of events, people are seeing what's going on in the community. They say, you know what, I'd rather take part of this rather than destroy the community. So this is a Rock the Block event. It's, um, we're reaching out to the hip-hop community in the Hallville um, community. And so, um, you know, we have rap ministers come out, you know, on poetry, we focus on poetry, dance, graffiti, um, all on that space right there. Um, the next thing we, ha we have, we have opportunities for um, people in the community to be able to, you know, have their birthdays right there on the space. Um, people were asking about doing weddings, um, you know, just using the space. And you know what, the t as far as we're concerned, the team, uh, we, we decided that we want this space to be an absolute community space where people can come and do as they please, so that they keep them, you know, up on the maintenance and they're not dirty in the place and, you know, tagging, you know, the car. That happened to us one time. But, but you know something, I'm gonna close with this, by the way. Um, they tag the car. They actually put one of those um, anarchy signs, and um, <coughs> that very morning, I seen it on my camera. I actually got security camera pointing to it. And so I seen that, I woke up 5.30 in the morning, I pulled out my soap and my brillo, and started scrubbing away. Ever since then, it never happened again, because I think that they realized that we're not just gonna let you destroy our space. That's it, thank you. <laughs> Cool, so we got a couple more minutes left, so I just, just go ahead and just open it up and see if there's a question. Um, you first. Yeah, go the address of the park, I, I yes. get on by it, but I don't know if I can find it again. It's 58 North Holmes Avenue. Just south of Washington. Uh-huh. 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 Right off of Washington, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who, uh, who ultimately owns the lot? I mean, oh, good question. You know, Bottle Cultural, um, I actually have it in my notes. I totally forgot to mention it. Eduardo and Emma uh, Luna, they own the space. Um, there's a little bit of a story behind that. Um, but yeah, they're the proud owners of it. Great. That's how I actually found it. Eduardo. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I found out about it because I was at the 5 by 5 uh, funding event oh, right. where they won the, uh, they won the funding for the, the $10,000 for the car part. So I was at that like sort of vacant park space that they had with the exhibit mm -hmm. out a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. And that's when they said, like, just drive by, go and shoot, yeah. make a little yeah, find it. You know, one of the things we usually say is something like, um, you know, we ran we ran out of space to park on this on, on, on the street, so we decided to park it right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to hear that you uh, you're open up so that the, the residents can use it. Uh, we've been trying to do that in our neighborhood. Your lady just trying to come up with all kinds of activities so that the neighbors can get involved with the birthday. You know, I always tell them to you know, use it. Uh, one's a comment, one's a question. The comment is, uh, because our neighborhood is a large here, we, we raised the funds, had a uh, artist do it. Um, but what it, none of us considered was, and it was on a private building, mm -hmm. so we obviously worked with the owner to get an image that he liked too. What none of us considered was the community. 
condition before, which I think when you're talking about a public mural, you have to look at that from the very beginning Absolutely. is what's the condition of the site, yes. because that will affect how your uh, overall will end up. Uh, the question is, if it's privately owned, being used by the public, how are you funding insurance or liability? Yes, yeah, so um, from the way I understand... So no one will do an aesthetic review, no one will say, no, you can't put that there. Um, unless it's in the historic district, if it's a historic district, then it has to go to, through the historic preservation process, and there is a public notice, and you have to get a certificate of appropriateness. If it's not difficult, the Arts Council can help walk you through that, even if we're not helping you with the mural. The VA will be happy to tell you all about that. Um, so it's good. And so this is a really, really friendly town for murals. I have colleagues in Atlanta, I have colleagues in LA, and they're just tearing their hair out about murals because it's really, really difficult to get them done. It's easy to get them done. Traffic signal box, paperwork, and then if you want to, and we'll talk to anybody about anything at the Arts Council as long as it's public art, just call me, set up an appointment, I'll come to you, show me whatever you want to show me, we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, and then one more thing I want to remind you guys about, or two more, I'm sorry. Uh, one is you have those like purple evaluation sheets. If you could go ahead and fill this out with all the best answers and say everything was great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we love it. And we really helpful. And then secondly, um, more importantly, lunch is right after this. So lunch is going to be over at Alumni Hall, and um, there should be all the public allies. You see them in the gray hoodies or gray shirts. Um, they'll be there to lead you there. So that'll work out really well. Um, otherwise, hope this has been helpful. Um, yeah, contact Amelia, ask for our support questions, and we'll be inspired.